Good evening. Welcome to the Replenish Me Show. On the Replenish Me Show, we have dynamic, dynamic guests to help female entrepreneurs to stay replenished in their mind, body, spirit, so that they can continue to powerfully impact the world with their purpose and vision. Hello, my name is Cordelia Gaffar, and I'm your hostess. I am an author and a co-author with Oprah Winfrey and America's Leading Ladies, an award-winning speaker, and a transformational business consultant where I help women one-on-one -on -one and with my group coaching programs. Visit my website, CordeliaGaffar.com. Now for tonight's show. Hello, Mel. I'm so excited to have you on my show because um, I love to talk about food. <laughs> <laughs> and that is like your total passion. You're, um, I know you're like a nutritionist and you've studied and you've lectured and all that, but it, it, it seems like that's actually your life's passion. Yeah, it's, it's from as from as long as I kind of remember, really, food has been a really big part of my life. Um, I've not always loved it, but when I was growing up, you know, very young, my, my dad, uh, he traveled the world with his work. Um, he was a wildlife cameraman and photographer. And so he would come back in those days when you could bring food into the country via plane. He would bring food from other countries and recipes and he was a good cook. So he, he brought interesting meals compared to the foods that my friends were having at school. Um, we had really wonderful creations. So yeah, I was exposed to all sorts of different flavors and wonderful foods from a really young age. Ah, that makes sense now. Okay, that's super exciting. Shall I, shall I tell you about my, my claim to fame? Um, yes. So one of the things that he did in his work was um, some special effects. So in the UK, Cadbury's chocolate is sort of our, our national favorite, as it were. Yes. And one of the adverts in the 1980s was where this sort of bar of chocolate emerged from this sea of, of melting Cadbury's chocolate. And, um, and then the, the, the message was there was a glass and a half of milk in every bar. So, you know, of course, it's good for you. Um, and so he did the special effects as some of this chocolate emerged up and the droplets of chocolate and things. So the, the benefit, the bonus of him doing that was that we kind of got like a lifetime supply oh. of chocolate. Oh. A child's dream. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so my mum bought this big chest freezer for our garage. And that's where we stored like giant slabs of the stuff. Mm. And it just go in the freezer and with a hammer, knock a chunk off. And uh, yeah, so that's that I blame I blame my dad for my sweet tooth, which <laughs> I still very much have today. <laughs> You know, we could blame our dads for worse. I think he did a great job. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't complaining. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, that is amazing. What a great childhood memory, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very much so, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know what I'm curious about, though? Because I also kind of grew up with, like, loving food and my grandmother was like a gourmet cook and she catered weddings and stuff and my dad you know is from Barbados and stuff so but when I studied nutrition there were some things that I didn't necessarily agree with and I was wondering if, if that came up for you at all um well probably in the last in the latter part of my my current career I'd say I've I have studied nutrition for, you know, when I came out of school, I started to focus on studying it. And what I do now in terms of my practice 
is I practice non-diet nutrition. I am an anti-diet nutritionist, shall we say. And it's been quite a revelation, I think mostly in the last five to seven years, where I've really kind of cottoned on to this idea that maybe what we're told, certainly from our government and from how research and studies are reported, that we don't always have to believe what we read. And I very much have come around to the idea that, you know what, diets, they cause more harm than good. And I have quite an interesting personal history with food. And let's just say I have dieted in my, my younger years and practiced a lot of food restriction. And so what I see now, certainly coming from you know, our government messages and what I see in social media around food is that you know, we are all getting fatter, we, we live in this obese nation and that really we, many of us need to aim to lose weight. Right. Because the assumption is that thinner equals healthier, which of course it doesn't. It doesn't. And I, I, I came away from my lecturing career. I left higher education coming up to two years ago now. And that was when I started to sort of explore this idea of intuitive eating, looking, looking at weight science. Mm -hmm. and looking at actually sort of the, the mortality figures and statistics that go with weight loss studies and trials and kind of felt like I'd been brainwashed into, you know, I was teaching nutrition students around health management. We talked about combating, you know, overweight and obesity and diabetes and heart disease. And all the time it was, well, yes, you encourage people to lose weight because that will reduce the risk factors. And it was kind of like a light bulb moment. I went on some training with a dietitian and it was like, oh, do you know what? If you, if you really look at the data, if you really look at the keynote studies, it's not really telling us what we're being told. And so I started to shift my approach, kind of unlearn a lot of the beliefs that I had before. And yeah, there's, there's a lot out there in terms of, you know, nutrition and food reporting that I don't agree with or believe at all. And so I'm kind of fighting my corner to not demonize carbohydrates and sugars and high fat foods, low fat foods, high protein foods, low protein foods, vegetarian diet, <laughs> all these messages that are kind of compartmentalizing food into little pockets that we should or shouldn't have. And that's what I don't, that's what I don't agree with. Yeah, so I don't, I don't promote any fattiness. I'm not a big fan of, I'm not a fan of keto diets. People will probably want to throttle me for that, but you know, I just, <laughs> yeah, there's lots that I don't agree with. So I'm quite passionate in putting out there what I genuinely believe is right, which is based on fact. And see, that's what I love about you. We agree on, on that. We definitely yeah. agree on that. So um, I just want to highlight the fact that you are a registered um, dietitian and you have like, what, almost three decades in the field and you stand firm in the no diet. What, what is the, the term you just came up with? Um, I'm an anti-diet. Anti-diet, anti yes. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So this is, uh, you know, you want to watch Mel Wakeman. She is the one to go to on that. But that's really not what we're talking about today, is it? Today no. we're talking about sleep. <laughs> yes. So um, in the next segment, when we come back, I'm going to dive deep into um, all the things about is there power in a power nap? We'll be right back with that. Welcome to Life Coach Radio Network. On Life Coach Radio Network, we have many shows such as Undivided with Frank Maduri and Muddy Money Matters. Every week, tune in live on Wednesday, the first and third Wednesday of the month to enjoy 
Undivided with Frank Maduri. He has very interesting topics and many things to share. And of course, on the second and fourth Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, enjoy the Replenish Me show. Thank you for listening to Life Coach Radio Network. And now we're back and we're going to get in today's, into today's topic, which is, is there power in a power nap? So is there power in a power nap? <laughs> God, yes. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Do you know, you know, as much as everything that I do kind of focuses on food and nutrition, of course it has to be wider than that. There's a really close connection between sleep naps and food you know our diet our food preferences and our food choices and our appetite and things like that and actually even though you know this is this has been my career I, for me personally i think sleep is more important than food for me you know if yes i know i agree <laughs> yeah. you know we do we people might have all sorts of different pillars of health, but if we just had, you know, four pillars in terms of diet, sleep, exercise, stress management, sleep for me is a winner because if I don't sleep, then everything else kind of falls out of line. And when I'm getting enough sleep, the other pillars kind of fall back or start to fall back into place. It's, it's hugely, hugely important. And we know it's really important for our health, but many of us seem to think it's not so important or struggle to prioritize it or know what to do when, when we struggle to get enough sleep in terms of hours or, or quality of sleep. So what kind of foods can we eat um, to make sure that we sleep at night? Or is that the formula? Is it more about... Um, eating so that, or, or, or not eating at night? Like what, what's the formula? Oh, right, how long, how long have we got? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's lot, there are quite a lot of factors that, that come into play here. And we, we, don't, we don't ever want to go to bed hungry, okay. okay? Because if we are hungry, we will not sleep, okay? Okay. Our body will be trying to tell us and it'll be giving out signals that get louder and louder, which will ultimately mean that you can't sleep until you go down and get something from the fridge. And you know, there may be listeners thinking, yeah, well, I've actually had to get up in the middle of the night. I've woken up and I'm so hungry. Um, your body won't really wind down and prepare to sleep if, if your energy levels are low. It kind of stems from you know, our evolutionary ancestors, you know, when, when we were hungry, we were vulnerable. Mm, okay. So when we're hungry and we have genuine hunger cues, the idea is that we go and get something to eat because it kind of increases our chances of survival, whether we're dealing with emotional stress or physical stress. So sleep is not conducive to, to being hungry. But then on the flip side of the coin, going to bed and trying to sleep on a big meal also isn't going to happen <laughs> because your body's trying to digest this meal and particularly if it's like a large meal or a, a fatty rich meal it's kind of going to bring on heartburn you're just going to feel uncomfortable you probably you know if you've ever done that you realize that it's just again it's not very conducive to sleep so there's kind of a little bit of a balance that we need to find in terms of when we have our evening meal, you know, in relation to when we go to bed, do we have snacks? I know, I know I've heard of some, you know, quite strong opinions about, you know, not eating after 6 p.m. or not eating after 8 p.m. or however many hours before we go to bed. It's really personal. It's whatever works for you. But it's not just what you've eaten that evening it's also about what you will have eaten during the day um, and how those foods might affect your blood sugar levels um, 
So, you know, certainly having something really sugary and sweet before you go to bed is going to give you a really nice pick me up. But again, that that may not be particularly good for helping your body wind down. So it's thinking about, you know, in terms of looking to improve your sleep quality, it is thinking about what you're eating throughout the whole day. It's not just that bedtime, um, sort of, you know, evening meal time. But there are, I think there are certain foods that are sleep promoting that may help our body better prepare for winding down, calming down and preparing to sleep. Okay, so let's let's break it apart a little bit. What should I be eating for breakfast and lunch? Or should I, I mean, is it that I should front load my eating or? It's, do you know what? It's really, it is really personal. I think, you know, in terms of my non-diet approach, I'm, I'm not prescriptive at all in terms of I would be more concerned with or more in tune with you eating when you're hungry as opposed to set times of the day. I kind of get that when our schedules are really busy that we worry about finding those times and we often will grab opportunities because they're the only times that we've got. So, you know, in terms of having breakfast, yeah, I, I find that now not a lot of people are, are into eating breakfast. You know, this idea of getting up, getting ready, going to work or whatever it is that we're doing, dropping the kids at school. I, I can't wake up and then suddenly be in the mood to eat, <laughs> you know? So, I think it's important to have something in the morning. And for me, what we're looking at in terms of not only just for sleep, but our general health and well-being, it's trying to keep things ticking over like a little boat rocking gently on a nice calm sea. Because as soon as our blood sugars start to go up and down like a yo-yo, that's very likely to cause not only our energy levels to surge and then plummet, but it will affect our mood mm. and our ability to concentrate and focus and do the things that we want to do. So, you know, breakfast can be something quite small, you know, whether it's a piece of fruit or, you know, some yogurt to go with that, or it can be more substantial. It kind of depends on, you know, your appetite and what you're going to be doing for the day. But good, good choices would be things like, and I'm conscious of sort of my, my English language really, but um, porridge or oatmeal would be, would be a good sort of slow release food, which is gonna keep you, you know, stop you wanting to snack all the time or want to crave sweet foods, whole grain, wholemeal toast, but adding in some protein yeah. really helps with that as well. And we need that protein to be able to make not only our feel good hormones, but have the building blocks to make our sleepy hormones later on in, in the day. Mm. So whether it's protein coming from, you know, eggs or fish, or I think certainly for us British people, we're quite, quite narrow minded in our idea of breakfast. Right. We don't get, we don't think out the box a lot of the time. We are kind of cereal and toast people. I know that's really general, but you know, the idea of having, you know, meats and cheeses and, um, you know, rice and fish and more savoury foods right. um, can bring a lot of really good nutrition to us, as well as, you know, the energy and the protein as well. Yeah, I like that. So then on the other end of the day, right, what are some um, foods that could help us to wind down? Okay, so... We've got the options of, of, of food, like what I'd call sort of sleepy, sleepy snacks or nibbles, and there's, and there's drink options as well. So I guess what we're, what we're looking for um, are foods that are rich in protein. So what we need to help us sleep are sort of calming hormones. So melatonin is our predominant sleepy hormone that helps our body wind down. And we start to make melatonin when it starts to get dark outside. Mm. So we have like this master biological clock, which is influenced by daylight hours and sunshine exposure. 
Um, and our body can just get a little bit confused when we are in, you know, we're starting to go into winter, well, autumn, winter months, and it starts to get dark quite soon. And of course, we've got all this artificial lighting and things like that. But our body will get into a rhythm of starting to slow down. And we need protein, we need what we call little amino acids called tryptophan to make, to make, it gets a bit complex now, get, make serotonin, that's our feel good hormone. Mm. And then we turn the serotonin into melatonin. So in terms of your evening meal, it's always quite good to have some form of protein in there, plant-based or animal-based. It's actually quite good to have protein regularly throughout the day. Mm. But like seeds and nuts are quite a nice snack to have before bed you don't want to have anything that's too heavy or stodgy you know in terms of what I, what I mentioned earlier so seeds and nuts can are really rich in tryptophan so like walnuts and almonds and cashews and you know, sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds and chia and flax seeds and things that you could you know just have in their raw form as a little little snack in a little pot or a handful but putting into into your, some, I quite, I'm quite a fan of cereal at bedtime or yogurt. Oh, wow. I, I, I could eat cereal at any time, <laughs> personally. That's, that's just me. But it can just help your body find this level of calm and wind down. I think many of us like will decide, oh, it's time to go to bed. And we'll suddenly decide and we'll switch all the lights off and get ready for bed. And we're in bed and turn the light out. And we kind of expect our body to go with the off switch as well and of course it doesn't really happen like that it doesn't <laughs> particularly if you've been on your phone and or your, your ipad or what no watching tv um it's we need to support our body winding down so having having a little protein snack and an hour or two before you go to bed can be can be quite a useful way to get those things in um some people quite like a milky drink mm. um, and it's interesting that one because there's not a lot of tryptophan in milk or in dairy to sort of make us feel sleepy. I think probably, you know, what's going on is more of a memory or association with childhood experiences. You know, I remember as a child, even probably preschool, in terms of having, whether it was a, you know, a hot chocolate or a warm milky drink, it's kind of soothing. Mm -hmm. And that warmness is quite comforting. So it might just be that sort of internal warmth that is, again, going to help us calm down. Or we might just remember sort of comforting connections or uh, memories that might sort of go, into, oh yeah, and take us into that sort of nice place, as it were. Um, I kind of have a question about that because um, it's interesting you talk about milky drinks because just last night my husband had milk before dinner or before bed and he was like, I slept so well. And I have this habit of um, having a calcium supplement at dinner time. And I also sleep quite well. And I, I remember some years ago reading something about if you're going to have calcium supplement to have that in the evening. Do you think that it's the calcium in the milk? I know they've really done a number on our milk these days, but is, is, do you think that's a possibility? I, my, my gut is saying, I'm not sure. I, I'm kind of thinking not in terms of what we've looked at as, yeah. as the different components and ingredients of foods right. that can affect energy and mood levels. I'm not, I'm not convinced, I'm not going to say no, because there are lots of elements that we don't know how, how they work. And calcium has roles in sort of muscle function. And so whether there's an element there, I'm not going to say no at all, but I think it's probably more to do with perhaps the experience of having that milky drink for your husband. Um, and there could be other things that you're doing, Cordelia, that might also be linked to supporting your sleep. So I think some of us are sometimes just born good sleepers and some of us aren't. Yeah, I know. Actually, that's my case. I just thought that would be a cool question. <laughs> <laughs> it is a cool question. <laughs> but pretty much for me, you know, I'm in that, that my body just like soon as it, it knows that the sun's about to set, 
I have forewarned my family, look, either your night crew or your mommy crew, because mommy crew has to go to sleep now. Let's move towards bed, right? Night yeah. crew, go hang out with your dad. So um, <laughs> that's pretty much how I handle that. So let's, yeah. let's um, a little bit focus about during the daytime. Now, I know that sometimes we have a dip, like around between two or three o'clock in the afternoon, right? Some people yeah. do, it's, I, th it's, I think it's kind of natural. Is there something to be said about just turning out the lights and sleeping? Well, I think you, you'll get to the point where, you know, particularly, and I, I've done this in terms of just cannot concentrate and feel like my eyes are getting heavier. And actually, if I just laid my head on my desk, <laughs> I could probably drift off. And I think, I think that's quite telling. Um, if, if you're really fortunate enough to be in a flexible workspace where you've got little sleep pods, because I know they exist, or <laughs> you work for yourself and you're kind of in control of your schedule, I, I know I benefit from a nap a sleep, an afternoon sleep, a nanny nap, a nana nap, whatever you want to call it. I used, I used to think um, when I was a little bit younger um, that, you know, naps and sleeps in the afternoon were for old people. That's what old people did <laughs> because I kind of remembered my, you know, my grandparents, that's what they did. They'd have their lunch and they'd fall asleep on the, on the sofa. Um, I think, you know, with, with our, the, the challenge is today is that our waking days are longer than ever before. You know, our work, we are working longer and longer hours. We're being, we're awake for longer because of wonderful devices like, like this, that we kind of you know, use for alarms and check first thing in the morning at last, and last thing at night. And we are sleeping less. We're definitely sleeping less. And when you look at sleep statistics, more and more of us are going to sleep nearer to 11 o'clock at night and midnight. Wow. Um, and I think, you know, we can't expect to maintain a high level of function on six hours sleep. We, we know that if we have less than six hours sleep consistently over a period of time, that it does have an adverse effect on our health. It does. It raises our risk of diabetes and heart disease. Um, and that evidence is real, yet for some reason we kind of think that, you know, sleep is for the weak or sleep is cheating. I, I really believe that if you've got an opportunity to have a nap and you feel tired, then take the nap. Um, and that's probably preferential to trying to continue to wade through the treacle and rely on the caffeine and the sweet things and think that you can keep going at your work. Um, just forgot what else I was going to say actually on that one. Um, but I think, you know, food obviously is really important coming back to your question about what do we eat during the day? Again, what we're looking for in terms of supporting our energy levels and our focus and concentration throughout the day is we want to try and again, keep this boat rocking gently in terms of our blood sugar levels, we want to be having foods that are slowly releasing energy into our, our bloodstream as it were. But it's quite typical, I think, in the afternoon, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, that many of us have this lull. Because it often it's, start, it's the start of this trigger where your body's going, going to say, well, I want to start winding down. You've, I've been awake for eight hours now. You, I haven't really stopped. So, things that we can do at that point is actually maybe we do need a snack. We, maybe we need a pickup. I am, I am a big fan of snacking in terms of we need to keep regularly topping up our energy levels. Um, so having something sort of wholesome and nutritious that might keep us going until we get home and we cook our dinner. Um, are, have you drunk enough? Feeling tired yeah. is commonly due to dehydration so one of the key signs of, of not drinking enough so think back and have you drunk enough during the day get a drink if it's after three o'clock i probably wouldn't go for anything that's caffeinated 
as, as Cordelia has a sip of water. <laughs> so have a drink. And the other thing as well is move about. Yeah. If possible, go out and get some fresh air. It may be that, you know, you've been stuck at your desk or you've just been, you know, focusing on, on a task or job at hand and you've kind of forgotten to breathe and move. And actually, even if we just go outside and, and get a bit of fresh air and oxygenate our body, it can quite quickly give our energy levels a real boost. It can just help our mind to recharge, refresh and reinvigorate us. And actually, maybe that was all we needed. And we didn't need the coffee or we, maybe we didn't need the snack. Maybe we don't need the sleep. We just need to move around and we just become stagnant in where we're at. So there's a number of things that we could do. So it sounds like what you're telling us is there's, there is a formula there for the pickup, right? And, and I think this is pretty universal, right? So we can first check in on our hydration yeah. by drinking water. If that doesn't do the trick, we can um, get something to eat, you know, something very nutritious. And if that doesn't work, then go get some fresh air and definitely move about. So, yeah. um, yeah, that sounds <clears throat> really helpful. And you know what I find also is when I move more in the afternoon, I sleep better at night. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a direct connection between moving, and this, this doesn't have to be, you know, getting yourself to the gym and getting a big sweat on. It's literally like walking. <laughs> yeah, pretty walking simple. has wonderful benefits. And we know that for those people who are more active and actually engage in more walking, they sleep for longer, they fall asleep more quickly, yeah. and they have better quality sleep. So that your sleep is deeper, which is better for us in helping us recharge and recuperate our body, process all our thought processes and, and in terms of our memory. And, you know, it, I can appreciate, you know, we get into that position where we kind of feel tired and lazy and we don't want to do anything, but actually if we can just put a bit of effort into walking and if you can get out into green space, if there's any greenery around you, even the, the sight of green trees and bushes and blue sky can give us a serotonin boost a boost of our feel-good hormone that, when, that we can then turn into me melatonin a bit later on when we want to go to bed. When we so need yeah, to. moving, definitely. So what about, we are that type of person that goes to the gym in the evening. Um, is that bad? I, no, I don't think it's bad. I think it's really personal, very individual. Yes. Um, yeah, there is a, an element of a, Sort of a metabolic boost, if you like, in terms of you often feel more energized after you've been to the gym and done some activity. And that may make you more aware, alert and more awake yeah. at night time. But you've got to weigh up that balance of, actually, if you then have a good wind down time, it might help you fall asleep and sleep more deeply. And also, if it's the only time of day that you can kind of find the time to exercise or it's the only time that that class is on that you want to do, is it better to exercise than not exercise? Yeah. And I think, you know, as an individual, you will know if you're an evening exerciser or not. Some people do better in the morning. Some people are better during, you know, sometime during the day in their lunchtime. Whatever works for you, to be honest. I love you, Mel. You are so non-judgy. I love it. <laughs> and you, I, you bring... <laughs> I, I'm not, see, I, I genuinely, I'm not, I'm not sat on the fence. I genuinely believe that it has to be what works for you. You know, yeah. it's about each of us finding our own path. <laughs> no, of course, I, I was making a joke. But, you know, clearly, I mean, the way I'm hearing you is you're really encouraging awareness. You're encouraging um, being in touch with your body. Yeah. listening to the, you know, taking a minute and not just rushing to, you know, do what you've been told or rushing to throw something in your mouth or, you know, 
um, or forcing your body to do anything, you're, you're strongly encouraging, just listen, just pay attention to the signs of what is happening. Yeah. And that's, I mean, a little sidestep, I guess that's really where my, my non-diet approach comes from. If we look at sort of the rules and the rigidity of, of plans and structures that diets encourage us to follow, all that does really is, is disconnects us from our body. If we you know it sounds easy in principle, isn't it? And I get this in terms of Mel, just write me a diet plan. Just <laughs> show me what I've got to do. Tell me what I've got to do and I'll do it. And I'll go, no, <laughs> because following those plans means that you tune out of your body. Your self-awareness fizzles out and coming back to this, you know, having a, a drink or a snack or some fresh air in the afternoon. You know, a lot of people that I, I meet just genuinely don't really know what hunger feels like. They don't know if they're hungry at four o'clock, but mm. kind of go for a snack anyway, because it's time and it's just habit and things that we do. But if we don't know we're hungry, then it can open up us eating for comfort boredom. You know, at three or four o'clock in the afternoon, it's classic that either we are bored <laughs> now because we've been in work all day and I'm kind of looking forward to going home or we're sort of procrastinating. Mm. And therefore we're eating for, for non-physical reasons. I'm not, not saying that that's, that's entirely wrong, but when we're disconnected with our body, yeah, we don't really know. We can't interpret or we're just deaf to the signals that our body is giving us to say, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I'm stressed, I'm tired. Yeah. Yeah, and those are really super important. So let's get into a little bit about people who are numbed from their bodies. Like it's, um, you, you said that often you, you have people that don't even know when they're hungry. Do they know when they're sleepy? Yeah, um, I'd say it's easier to notice sleep signals and cues because it's that your. I mean, I think when we look at hunger, your your body, like it does with sleep, there's there's a level of signals that it will start to make you aware of, and I guess it's kind of easy to ignore the subtle nuances of feeling tired and sleepy, just as we might do in terms of, am I hungry or not? Am I bored? Am I, am I procrastinating? Now, we, we can't survive without eating and we can't survive without sleep. But I think it's more obvious when we get really tired, but for some reason we continue to fight it. I mean, very much the, the signals that come from us when we're hungry are often very similar to those that when we're tired we will start to daydream mm -hmm. our mind will wander if you're trying to read something you'll probably find that you're reading the same sentence or paragraph multiple times and it's just not going in yes both of those experiences are are the same whether we're hungry or or we are tired that's true yeah and the intensity will just get stronger and stronger right and I think we believe that we can ignore both of those signals for hunger and for sleep. And at some point, there'll be a real sense of urgency around, you know, that time where you just like, you suddenly become impatient, ratty, you like, you lose your sense of humor. Yes. There's that little straw that breaks the camel's back and it's just like, then there comes this outburst, like that, that emotional sort of personality change. Yeah. Is, <laughs> like, who is that? <laughs> yeah, is also a sign. Now, I, I get both of those. A, when I'm hungry, I, I get hangry, but also when I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's up to us. It is, it is a choice, of course, but it's up to us how long we can hold out for. But at some point, we're going to give in. Right. So when we're very, very hungry, we get, we get a sort of what we call a primal hunger. It's that intense yeah. urgency to eat. It's like you walk in 
your home, you open up the kitchen doors and you're just looking at stuff to almost like jump into your mouth. You don't really <laughs> care what you want to eat, do you? You just, you just <laughs> need food. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when we get really, really tired, there'll come a point where we will just crash out and fall asleep. We never want to get to that point, either with sleep or with hunger. You know, if we are more aware of these signals, such as, you know, the failing mind, <laughs> the, the, the concentration things that start to go, your, your eyes will start to get heavy. Right. You know? and, and being, feeling very tired is very much like being, being drunk. It's being under the influence of alcohol. Huh. Okay. So your reactions slow down. Your speech can become quite slurred as your body is really starting to sort of preserve its energy stores to keep your brain functioning. Mm. And so your other sort of non-important things like coordination and ability to speak start to fall <laughs> by the wayside. And at some point you're just going to fall asleep and you'll just fall asleep. Like I have done many a time. It's like, you know, you, you, you sit down and you're watching your TV program. And when you suddenly, so let that adrenaline rush go because you stopped. It's like gone. So I sit there watching a program with my husband and like five minutes in and I'm, I'm gone. Yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so familiar. And um, I, you know, you, you uh, brought up adrenaline. So that made me think of something. I have this habit of when I go to the movies with my kids, they want to see these like Marvel action movies or whatever. If there's too much stimulation, I actually fall asleep. Is that a real thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> you have good questions, Cordelia. <laughs> mm, that's an interesting one. I'm now thinking. When we, in principle, when we think about stimulation and adrenaline, adrenaline is part of our stress response. It is designed to increase our level of alertness and wakefulness. Right. <laughs> there to enable us to, you know, fight the emotional battles or leg it and run away from the saber tooth tiger, as it were. I'm kind of thinking in principle, that doesn't really fit. What I'm wondering is, is actually in your head, you're just going, I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> I don't really want to, I, I don't, I'm not really having fun. I don't want to be here. I'm doing this for my kids. Um, if you're not engaged in it, you will just switch off. Hmm. And it's probably just the need for you, maybe the need for you to sleep. Yeah, I know. Like, One to be fair, at one time I was actually tired and I just really didn't want to go. But another time it was a movie that I was really looking forward to actually. And it was just so much like bang, bang, shoot it up thing. I know that sounds so old fashioned, but it was just too much for me. And I just really clocked out. I was like, wow, are they still shooting each other? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that was it. Maybe just like, I can't cope with this. I'm just, I'm just going to switch off. Yeah. And then your body went into shutdown mode. And I, I guess it also raises this idea about um, adrenal fatigue. Mm. I'm not saying you've got adrenal fatigue, Cordelia. It's just when, when we are living in these lives of you know, sort of chronic stress, mm. we have, many of us have persistently high levels of cortisol, which is our main long-term stress hormone. And when we are under continuous sort of physical and or emotional stress, our adrenal glands that make this cortisol kind of just go, oh, I'm done. And we lose the ability to, to make more of it. We become a bit desensitized to it, which can have all sorts of, sort of negative effects on our metabolism and our immune system. So that, that could be where there is an indicator possibly of you know, not responding well to high stress situations or lots of physical, physical, emotional stress. And I just want to 
you know, insert a disclaimer here. We're not, this, the purpose of this podcast is not to give any um, medical advice. If you are experiencing any of these symptoms, please see your healthcare provider. And if it's, you know, anything, you know, that you have a question about, this is not our realm of expertise. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. Yes. We're just, we're speculating and just, just chatting. Yes. Yes. So with the last um, portion of the show, when I come back, we're going to find out more about what Mel's up to right now and what program she has and how we can find her. So we'll be right back. I'm so excited to share that America's Leading Ladies book is now available in paperback. I picked up my copies today and um, you can now click on that link on my website, which is cordeliagafar.com and order your signed copy of the book. This is 320 pages of pure gold, starting with Oprah Winfrey, um, with some of the most dynamic women in North America. We have Jenny Zhu, we have um, Tina uh, Taran Chian, who I interviewed in the author series. We have um, Dr. Marie Floor, La Tortue, we have uh, La Le Hancock, we have Marjorie Salson. These are all, um, and Paula Vale, let's not forget her, and Natalie Rextad, who is right after, um, or right before Melinda Gates, um, and Claudia Harvey, who is right after Oprah Winfrey. So, um, and the lovely Catherine um, Gruner, who um, I immediately bonded with, and the other Catherine, who I also bonded with, Catherine Rolf um, Martin, and um, Anita Hawkins, and uh, Leah Williams, and Rhonda Farah. These are all, actually, some of the names that I just named are women who have been recognized by the International Association of Top Professionals. Um, so there's 12 of those women in this book as well. Um, America's Leading Ladies Who Positively Impact Our World Stories of Courage, Challenge, and Triumph. Get your copy on CordeliaGafar.com today. Now, back to the show. Hi, I'm Mel Wakeman, and I am the creator of the Anti- diet solution. So as an anti-diet nutritionist, I get that diets, they don't work for most people. In fact, they cause more harm than good. And what diets do is they cause you to become disconnected from your body. You lose, you lose touch with your body and you lose enjoyment with food. If anything, diets create a lot of fear around foods as well as worsening your health. They genuinely do. So what I've created is a brand new online group program. So you get to be with other people that are on the same journey of letting go of fad diets, food rules, and like nutrition nonsense. So this is about in enabling you to harness the power of your own body. Okay, you've got really well-functioning wiring systems in here that help you recognize when you're hungry and help you stop when you're full. So it's about respecting your body and learning to listen to it. So you can get rid of that guilt and frustration and feeling of failure that comes along when, when we do diet. So this 12-week program brings to you a weekly lesson that covers mm. Your, your eating mindset. We do a lot of work around your beliefs, around eating and hunger and yourself, because until you can free your mind to allow yourselves to eat food because you're hungry, but also because you kind of enjoy food and enjoying food and eating food that makes you feel happy is good, that's safe. But until you've shifted your mindset and let go of that diet mentality, you're not really going to be in a position to embrace new ways of eating, okay? And create 
longer term sustainable eating habits. So we're going to let go of those unhelpful food rules and beliefs. We're going to help you to recognize when you're hungry. You're going to understand why we crave stuff. What, what is all that about and how can we better manage those cravings in terms of allow us to nourish our body and mind. We're going to find how we can find the satisfaction button. What foods will enable us to feel yeah, I've really enjoyed that. I've had enough. It's not just about eating enough food to fill your stomach. We're going to get rid of the food police, learn how to deal with others that can pass judgment and criticism over our eating. And we're going to work on building our emotional muscles so that we can move away from comfort eating and rely on food as a crutch so often. We're going to find self-compassion. We're going to find inner calm and happiness in our own skin through looking at body acceptance and body respect. So then we're gonna look at how we can plan balance with our eating that's flexible, that brings joy, enjoyment and that is sustainable for us. So there's loads of tools that you'll get access to that you can then build your own personal toolkit, which means you never have to go back to dieting again. So we run in November and again in January. Okay, and we're back. And, you know, just to kind of summarize what we just talked about, I know we covered so much information on sleep, sleep tips, sleep routine. Um, if you go to wakemannutrition.com, she actually has the full guide. I'm going to just read some things to you. And I ask that you get your pen and paper out or however you take notes and just write down these three tips that I think can help you for your sleepy snack suggestions. She mentioned seeds and nuts. That's really perfect for calming and inducing um, sleep. And it's also very high in protein. Um, a warm mug of milk, she mentioned that also. And, um, and also there are different types of teas. In particular, she mentions green tea or sleepy tea. And now for the, the 12 uh, sleep tips, I'm just going to mention again here just three. Um, avoid caffeine after three o'clock. That's something that I think we kind of try to do. And another great one she has here is to have a hot bath, not a bubble bath before um, bedtime, but you know, with scents like lavender or geranium and passion flowers. You know, these um, like flower essences are a lot more calming. And finally, um, remember I had mentioned that I take a supplement, it's actually, it has magnesium in it. So she mentions magnesium citrate, um, is really great, but she has a full, um, guide for you with eight, uh, snacks and 12 sleeping tips. So you want to go to wakemannutrition.com and get your copy and help to have uh, a better sleep routine. So Mal, we know your website, but what else can we find there? What programs do you have? Oh, thanks, Cordelia. Um, well, I, I do a lot of work with um, clients, private clients on a one-to-one -one basis, where I work really closely with them to help them with kind of getting off this diet train, but also maybe dealing with you know, digestive problems. Um, I help individuals with sort of dealing with arthritis um, with menopausal symptoms with lots lots of wider health issues it isn't just around around weight loss and what i've now been creating over the summer is a group program an online group program so that i can take my knowledge and my skills to more people <laughs> so i'm launching well, I, I will have launched. I have launched my anti-diet solution program, which is a 12-week online group program, which has sort of 12 modules in it. There are weekly lessons. You get 
one-to-one -one coaching with me you get a sort of a group collective community feel with that and group coaching and the next one will be running in november and then again in january next year so i'm really really excited about that because it's taken my sort of my career's worth but my last two years in business with my private clients to help them let go of those unhelpful untruths and disbeliefs about food um, and eating so there's a lot of self-awareness that goes on in this that we've touched on today um, it's finding joy with food you know we 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 kind of get we eat for hunger and we we eat to fuel the body but we're allowed to eat for enjoyment you know there are going to be kinds where we want food for energy but we'll just eat food because it makes us feel good and, and that's okay. So doing a lot around our whole mindset around food, but also working on ourselves, how we see ourselves, how we accept ourselves, which is certainly something that, that diets don't get. They don't teach you any of that stuff. Diets tell you that you need to look like this and you need to do that and conform and yeah, I don't get any of that. So let's learn to accept who we are and find happiness in our own skin is how I'd put it. You know, there's a lot of life that we have to, lead, to live yet. And yeah. if we can allow food to bring enjoyment in that and get rid of these rules, um, then that's where you're going to find health and happiness. I love that. I, I love the joy in eating you know, and the self-acceptance. That's so very important. And, you know, related, but a little bit unrelated is we have to remember the ideal woman, right? Mm. Um, about a hundred years ago looked like, or not even, I mean, up until a hundred years ago, let's say, right? Looked um, very voluptuous, right? Yeah. And because a woman is a woman, let's just say that right? And yeah. we, we're supposed to have curves. So <laughs> embrace it. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. It's, for me, you know, beauty, of course, it, of course, it's more than skin deep. It's beauty yeah. is whatever size or shape you are. I, I know I have, you know, I have what is called thin privilege. I don't fully appreciate what it's like to live life in our society in a bigger body but god i get i get the stuff that goes on up here yeah so yeah let's embrace who we are and learn to love who we are because our body will love us back and and that's really the key is um when we enjoy life right then there's so much less stress, so much less anxiety, and we sleep better at night. So, <laughs> yes, we do. If we're more content with who we are, we will sleep better. So, any closing wisdom surrounding sleep? And have a nap as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and have a nap as well. I think. I think for sleep. Our, our body loves routine. It loves routine when it comes to sleep. So if we can find at least a little bedtime routine where we allow ourselves at least half an hour to start to wind down. If we can get rid of electronic devices at least for half an hour, if not an hour <laughs> before we go to bed, engage in things that are calming. I'm a massive believer of writing or listening to music, meditating, things that will help us de-stress and calm. And, you know, cut out the light, make sure you've had a snack, exercise, eat some wholesome foods, have a sleepy tea. Yeah, it's it's what it, that there are so many things that we can actually do that we could practice and implement. It is what works for you. So you can, if sleep is a real problem for you, you can in fact keep a sleep diary. You know, as a tool 
you can you know get a little notebook and you can write down you know you could rate your sleep in terms of you know one to five one was great one uh, one was let's say one was terrible five was great you know and link in what you've done during that day so if you really want to try and identify the factors that make you sleep better or disrupt your sleep keep keep a food and symptom sleep diary that would be really really powerful even if you did it for a week that would tell you a lot and definitely improve your self-awareness I thank you so much for joining us today on the Replenish Me show and sharing these wise tips about sleep. And now we know that there really is power and a power nap. <laughs> oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Cordelia. It's been, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Replenish Me show. Remember, sharing is caring, so share this with a friend. I'm sure that you've benefited and you've learned something new. Now it's time to implement and be the beacon of light that you're called to be in this world. With replenishing thoughts, until next week, good night.